one of the guards at the jail actually contacted me and told me he'd been writing me letters the entire time. He just didn't have my address. So he was clearly fixated the whole time. And three days later is making YouTube videos about me. And so, yeah, I've had to put him in multiple times uh, since. So this, people always say to me, I'm so sorry that happened to you. That sounds terrible. I'm so glad it's over. I'm like, it's, it's not over until one of us dies. Like, this is not, it's not over. Testimony continued today in the most notorious criminal trial in Richland County history. Dr. John Boyle is accused of killing his wife, Noreen, and burying her body in the basement of his new home in Erie, Pennsylvania. The 12-year-old son finally took the stand. As I heard a scream, I heard a thud. It was about this loud. We, the jury, find the defendant guilty. When I was 12 years old, my testimony sent my father to prison for murdering my mother. This podcast serves as a type of therapy and reconciliation for myself and it is my hope that it helps anyone who has experienced deception, betrayal, and dark trauma. I'm Collier Landry, and this is Moving Past Murder. Hey movers, what's going on? Welcome back to another episode of Moving Past Murder. I'm your host, Collier Landry, and what's going on? What's going on? What's going on? What's going on? Sometimes I sing, sometimes I don't. Today I did. We gotta live with that. I got a great guest this week that I'm really excited about, uh, but I'm gonna tell you a little bit about her in a moment. Um, I just wanna say thank you for all you guys that tune in every week. It really means a lot to me. For those of you watching me on YouTube, please click the like and subscribe buttons, please, and maybe a little bell that dings you too. For those of you that support me on Patreon, thank you so much. For uh, Patreon.com forward slash Call Your Landry is where you can find all of that. Um, your support means the world because there are no ads on this program, which means that it is only supported by listener view, <laughs> listener support. Uh, so, you know, hey, um, please help out if you can. Um, and if not, that's okay. I just appreciate you guys tuning in, liking, subscribing, telling all your friends, writing reviews, really good reviews, I hope, and uh, all that stuff. But no, in all seriousness. Um, but I want to get to, speaking of listeners, a, another listener question of the day, or actually listener comment of the day, which I found really funny. This is from Ashley Mitchell 288 on TikTok. And she was responding to my, another, of course, letter from my father uh, that I read on Father's Day, um, <laughs> which was part of my Father's Day episode, um, Happy Father's Day to a Horrible Father. Um, so uh, I'm gonna read her a little comment, which is just literally, I hate that I found narcissistic father TikTok, but I am also comforted by the fact that I'm not alone in airing it out and making dark jokes about it. Well, Ashley Mitchell 288, um, that's all we can do. All we can do is make really dark sardonic jokes. And I'm gonna tell you guys something. A lot of people over the years have questioned me and my sense of humor about this whole situation with my parents and, uh, you know, with the murder of my mother by my father, and how can you think it's funny? How can you say that? Look, I don't think it's funny, but humor is a way that we all process the world. I mean, look at all the troubled comedians that we've loved in the past, the Richard Pryors, <laughs> the Sam Kinnison's of the world, the, you know, the Robin Williams of the world. They all air out their, they have aired out their sort of troubled pasts and troubles uh, to, in a positive way. And um, it's to give back to the world and make the world laugh with them, right? Um, which is cool. And, and look, to be honest with you, my mother had a very sardonic and dark sense of humor a lot of times. In fact, in the movie of Murder of Mance, when we talk about my mother, I, I think we talk about this. And if we don't, I'm going to tell you about it right now. My mother's, <laughs> my mother used to say famous last words, and I've probably said this before, but my mother used to say famous last words was like always her little thing. Oh, famous last words. But she literally said to her best friend, the night that my father came home, the night that she was murdered, she said, oh, look, he brought his mother with him, so I guess he can't kill me tonight. And in fact, he did. <laughs> um, so I have to find a little bit of humor in that, and I think that my mother would find some humor in all of this too, because, you know, uh, what else are you gonna do? Be miserable and cry and just, uh, you know, I mean, Crying is good. Crying is healthy. I cry a lot, actually, even at the drop of a hat full of 
not kittens, but chihuahuas. Um, but in all seriousness, I mean, you just kind of have to take the world with a little bit of a grain of salt because then you'll go crazy if you won't. And I probably would be in a nut house a long time ago if I didn't have my mother's inherited sense of humor. <laughs> so here I am airing it out, making jokes about it because that's what we got and that's our gift to the world. And I share that with you guys every week and thank you again for tuning in. So speaking of getting sort of out your own personal trauma and looking at it, the, the world in a kind of a skewed perspective than I think most. And, and, and I, as I've said many times, and I think it's very apparent on anyone who, to anyone who listens to this program, I am a very, like I'm a perpetual optimist. I'm the guy that my friends go to when everything is down and they're like, Oh, let's talk to Collier because he has a great outlook on life. I mean, for the most part I do. And I, I try to be very positive about things. There are obviously very horrific things that happened. In fact, one of my friends was almost killed the other day by gunfire in Hollywood. And his passenger was shot twice in the abdomen as they were sitting on the street in his car talking. What is the world coming to? But again, uh, he is okay. He was missed. Uh, the girl who was shot twice, I believe in the abdomen, she is in intensive care and, um, but she is going to make it and she's going to survive. And that's amazing. Um, but it's still a horrific thing that happened. Um, there's a GoFundMe. I think we'll put it in the show notes actually. Uh, but on that note, um, so this, this guest I have today has lived a life just like me. I mean, not, same thing, but has lived through a lot of trauma, has lived through some really dark shit and is one of those people that is a very creative and inspiring person. And she's just a fun overall person to know. And I have gotten to really know her recently as I be, as I started the podcast and became very involved in the true crime world, you know, recently in the last, you know, four or five months, you know, leading up to crime con and I be, became made aware of her, but I've actually known her for probably close to a decade off and on because we have worked with different directors, different uh, uh, makeup artists and uh, different, uh, you know, casting agents because she's done casting before. So we've come in each other's orbit a lot of times, but we've never actually started to like sit down and like talk to one another or understand that, hey, we're both victims because a lot of people in my world in Hollywood did not know my story until I made a murder in Mansfield. So I wasn't always talking about it. I mean, they knew the ancillary details like, look, hey, Collier's dad killed his mom when he was a kid and that's all they really knew. So it wasn't until the film came out and end of 2018 that people started to like sort of know my story that were in my immediate vicinity. And, um, but Lenora Claire is my guest today. And so she has been kind of in the orbit uh, of my world. Now she is most well known as the Aaron Brockovich of stalking. And uh, uh, Lenora has a very interesting history. She has been a casting director. She was an art gallery owner. She is an artist herself and an actress and a performer. And she's just a really overall genuinely cool human being. And we actually finally, I mean, we, we've seen each other at events, but we finally sat down and had dinner with her wonderful husband. Henry and, uh, and Tara Newell was there and, uh, we got to talk and we, and we got to know each other really well. And I'm, and I said, look, you gotta be on the podcast. I got to interview you. Um, so Lenora had dealt with a very serious situation where she was dealing with a stalker, um, uh, that was, and I'm, I'm going to mess up the, uh, schizoaffective that that's the word I'm looking for. They were schizoaffective and, uh, they basically were stalking very high profile celebrities like Kim Kardashian, Gwyneth Paltrow, um, I, I believe others, and then Lenora. And it wasn't, you know, obviously people who are of that level as the Kardashians, they have their own private security and things like that, that handle these types of things for, for them. But, you know, Lenora was just a lay person like the rest of us, myself included, and, uh, you know, had to take matters into her own hands with the LAPD and really be proactive for her own survival and for her own safety. And she, um, and she did that and, and kudos to her for standing up. And now she's turned that uh, you know, she has moved past that and using her personal trauma and what she has been to, to help other victims from any, anywhere from writing restraining orders, uh, to working with the, uh, Los Angeles district attorney's office, the crime victims advisory board. Uh, and she has an agency called the Lenora Claire agency, and that agency helps to represent victims and survivors in true crime that are often having their stories exploited, or they are on shows like Dateline 48 hours, where 
they come in and they just kind of ramsack you and uh, they, you know, you, you just tell all your story and then you're kind of left hanging, you know, you don't get paid, you, you don't, you don't see a therapist afterwards. She kind of, she is not kind of, she is an advocate for those survivors to be able to get them treatment, to be able to get them paid, to be able to look out for them and their best interests when they're exposing and reliving and forced to relive so much of this tragic and traumatic circumstances that they have uh, they've had to endure or endure over their lives so uh, she you know kudos to her for doing that and for turning her her pain into her passion and and making a difference um, so I am pleased to welcome to the program Lenora Claire Lenora thank you so much for joining the program hey thanks for having me Collier we were just sort of side sidebarring before I brought you on um, regarding uh, the Johnny Depp case <laughs> and yeah. Amber Heard trial. And you had some interesting perspectives, but um, I want to get into that in a little bit, but I wanted to say thank you for joining the program, taking the time with us. But also I wanted to, you know, as I was explaining to you before, I have become very interested in uh, why people are drawn to true crime. And I know, you know, there are two types of people. There are people that are very much that are into it and are fans of it. And then there are people that are um, pulled into it, much like myself and you and our yeah. friend Tara Newell, uh, Kara Robinson Chamberlain. And um, I'd like to hear your story on how you uh, you got to be a part of this whole world. Oh, wow. Well, first, uh, I'll, I'll introduce myself for people who don't know me already. Um, as you said, my name is Lenora Claire. I am a activist. I am an advocate. I am um, a member of the Los Angeles District Attorney Crime Victims Advisory Board. I'm a longtime, just like yourself, entertainment industry professional. And I've started a company called Lenora Claire Consulting because I started realizing as I was telling my story that there can be this like really intense additional level of media-based trauma to people who have already been traumatized by nature of doing these shows. So I created the company, which kind of, what kind of got us all together, and it's, and it's been awesome because I started realizing that you know my experience as both a victim survivor and an advocate for victim survivors, but also a TV producer. Like, wow, that's a unique series of things that all kind of come together. So, um, anyway, I just wanted to like intro myself a little bit. Just I don't assume that everybody knows who I am, and, and I mean I like to pretend like everybody knows me, but not everybody knows me. Um, yeah, so I guess my story begins. I had a really unconventional childhood in Los Angeles. I was having a great time. I had opened up an art gallery. I was really proud of it. It was doing well. I used to back, back before I was like the sort of serious life that people know for me now, I used to do shows like Golden Girls Gone Wild, which was like erotic depictions of the Golden Girls. So I was having a great time. I had this really cool art gallery and I always have to sort of clarify for people, like my, my dad was a psychiatrist and I really don't want to stigmatize anybody who's struggling with mental illness. But as we get into my story and I talk about my stalker, my stalker is schizoaffective, which is the combination of schizophrenia and bipolar. So when I talk about that, I'm not saying that everybody who's schizoaffective is dangerous. I'm just saying my stalker's dangerous. So um, take it back to the year 2011. I open up my art gallery. I'm all over the, the press in LA. It's a really fun, exciting time for me. And there's a schizoaffective man whose birth name is Justin Masler, but he's legally changed it to Cloud Star Chaser. He's out in New York and he's stalking Ivanka Trump. Again, this is 2011 Ivanka Trump. And he's arrested multiple times for stalking her. He tries to kill himself in her store. Like this is a very scary, dangerous problem person. So he ends up jumping bail on one of the situations with Ivanka and he comes to LA. He opens up the LA Weekly where I was named one of the LA Weekly people of the year. So he sees this picture of me and he becomes really like fixated and he shows it to my gallery and he's wearing a spacesuit. And I'm the kind of person, like I'm used to quirky characters and I'm like, sure. like you, like, well, we'll talk to anybody, you know, like really friendly. And so this guy comes up and I was like, cool, Ziggy Stardust, what's up space man? You know, just talking to him. And I remember he was clearly very intelligent and he's looking at me and like, you know, when you can feel like the crazy just kind of come in, like the eyes start to spiral. I was like, oh shit. And he's looking at me and he's like, oh, you look like Jessica Rabbit. I'm like, oh, I hear that sometimes. And he looks right at me and I'll never forget it. And he goes, I'm gonna stalk you. And I was like, well, excuse me? So I, I kick him out of my gallery. I just, it was like really weird and jarring, but I didn't think that much of it. I was like, okay, weirdo, we kick him out of the gallery. I think it's all done. 
And then I start getting all these like calls from my friends because it had been in the news. I guess the Trumps had hired, again, 2011 Trumps, had hired bounty hunters to extradite him back to New York to stand trial for everything with Ivanka. And they're like, Is, isn't that the weirdo that you had the thing with? I was like, oh my God, it's so weird. So he goes to New York and then he goes to jail in Rikers Island and starts writing me these like really unhinged letters. And at first they're sort of like these just like long ramblings and like they're creepy, but I'm like, okay, whatever, dude's in jail in New York. And then they start to get progressively, like I hope, well, I, do you do trigger warnings on your show? Do you do that for people? For the I, 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 I try to as many times. Sometimes I forget to do them, but I, I try to, <laughs> yeah. Okay, so, so trigger warning if, if um, themes of homicide and sexual assault and kidnapping are triggering to you, then you may want to walk away for pet, pet your dog, go, go have a snapple. I don't know. Um, so he starts writing me these incredibly graphic, you know, depictions of how he's going to kill me, rape me, kidnap me. And I'm just thinking, oh my God. So I, I take it to LAPD Northeast division. Again, I have this like stack of incredibly graphic rape and death threats from a man with already a long criminal history. And <laughs> LAPD Northeast Division looks at me and um, if, I don't know, if, are they listening or watching this primarily? Is this mostly a podcast? It, it's, a, it's, a, it's a podcast, but there is a visual aspect. It goes okay. on YouTube as well. So, so our, okay. our so listeners it, will see you. <laughs> Okay, so if you're not watching and you're just listening, I have I have very bright red hair. So please tell me to dye my hair, get off the internet, you know, anything to like minimize myself, make myself less, basically fucking vanish. They're not gonna help me. So I became incredibly frustrated and I go back home and I was like, okay, so my stalker comes from a very wealthy family and he's never had a job ever in his life to my knowledge. And he just goes around the country stalking and harassing women, right? So. I start to track his IP from his email so I can get like an idea of where he is in the country so I know what level of danger I'm under because I'm like, no one's gonna help me. I have to learn like risk minimization myself. So sure. I like wipe, I wipe my address off the internet. Like I'm doing everything I can proactively, but again, it's every day. It's like how I'm gonna rape you, how I'm gonna kill you. And my stalker, so he's schizoaffective as I mentioned. He also has a personality disorder called erotomania, which is where they have a false relationship with you. It's kind of like, remember David Letterman's stalker who thought they were married and would break into his house? Um. No, but I see, <clears throat> I don't really pay attention okay. as much. And I think this is one of the things I think that you and I discussed is, you mm. know, is with stalking, you, you know, I don't know how seriously some people take it until it's too late. And, I, and you, you know, you and I were talking about that before, but, um, so no, I don't know these, these stalkers, but really sure. fast, what is schizoaffective? What does that mean? Schizoaffective. Exactly? Yeah. It's when I explain it. it's the combination of schizophrenia and bipolar. So he's schizophrenic, you know, he hears voices and all that kind of stuff, but the bipolar, he can be manic. So when the bipolar is kicking in the mania, I would get like 300 emails in one day. Then I knew he was manic at that point, but then he also gets depressive. That's the bipolar. So, but with the addition of schizophrenia. Oh, okay. So was he doing this when he was in Rikers? He was emailing you or this was after he, he was got out? At, the, at, that, at that point, it was physical letters he was sending to my gallery. And then as soon as he got out, it turned to emails. So... Um, cause he wasn't, New York has like some of the worst stalking laws in the country. So he yeah, I knew that, he didn't yeah. Spend, yeah, he didn't spend very, very long in, in jail that time. So, um, so yeah, so I start <laughs> that like, time. Track, that time. I mean, I've personally put him in jail five times myself. That's just, wow. Funny. Um, yeah. So, so my stalker again, he's, he's sending me these graphic rape and death threats. And what I was trying to explain is he's got a rod of mania. So sometimes he thinks we're married, we're in a relationship. And other times I'm the head of a Zionist conspiracy and he's got to gas me through my door with Zyklon B, which killed my relatives in the Holocaust. And that's his particular scenario, which is so, let me tell you, for years I had the worst insomnia because where I used to live, I live in a very safe situation now, but where I used to live was just a little apartment. You know, anybody could come in from the street and gas me through my door. So it was... It was, I did, I did not sleep well for like a decade. Um, oh so, God. right. So I'm kind of like learning these techniques to try to help myself to not get killed. And then I had, so I had to give up my art gallery because I couldn't have a public facing job where he could just come in at any time. So imagine your listeners, whatever you've worked so hard for, the thing you're so proud of your job, you have to like walk away from it. So that we don't, we don't really, with stalking, I always say it's kind of like sexual assault in the 70s, how like widely misunderstood it is. People don't get it. 
And people sure. don't understand how it really infiltrates so many aspects of your life, your relationship, your career. It's not, it's not just like a single singular thing. It's kind of like all encompassing. So I give up my, my gallery, which I was so proud of. And so I start working in reality TV. My mentor is this amazing guy. He, he gave me a whole new career and um, he sends my boss a death threat which as you can imagine, people are so terrified of workplace violence, especially all my coworkers are like Googling him and see he tried to kill himself in Ivanka store. So he's got this history of workplace violence. So, wow. uh, and again, like no, no shade on my former boss. Cause I, I worked for, basically once my stalker went to jail, which is years later, I worked for him again. Like we're totally cool. I love him. But what ended up happening was I just didn't get my contract renewed. So I, then lose, I then lose uh, that job. But more importantly, uh, Collier, I, I think you and I are very similar about this. It's like people can do something to us, but if you do something to a loved one, like that's it. Like I'm not standing for that yeah. at all. Like I, I yeah. cannot handle that. So when my boss got the death threats, I go back to police and I'm like, you have to do something. It's not just the death threats to me, it's to my mentor. Like you have to do something. Sure. And they were just as they were just as terrible to me. Like they wouldn't they wouldn't do anything. And so I was like, well, fuck this. I work in TV. So that's when I decided to go public. And it's really important to know I first went public in 2015. I went public before me too. So when I went public, let me just tell you the first TV show that I did. People saw me, they were like, oh, you just want attention. And I'm like, I've been on TV since I was six. Like, it's not about attention. I don't need this kind of attention, you know? Um, so people would tweet at me and it was, there was a lot of internalized misogyny. A lot of women would write me like, dress how you want to be addressed. And I made the mistake of wearing red lipstick and they really, they didn't believe me. And it was, just, it was awful. So it was just getting really bad. So anyway, I start kind of just going, this is bullshit. And I started coming up with ideas for, for legislative you know, proposals and all kinds of, and that's when I, I first met Congressman Adam Schiff. And again, this is before he was head of House Intelligence Committee, Adam Schiff. He was just like my local congressman. So uh, I met him through my friend, Polly Perrette. If people remember her from the show, NCIS, she's who connected us. She herself is also a longtime stalking survivor. So she connected me with Schiff. I started working with him, meeting with the district attorney and the city attorney and the chief of police. And he took my proposals to the Department of Justice. So here I am, this person who works in like reality TV. And all of a sudden, like my proposals are going to D. And I'm like, this, I guess, just what has to be. I started working with other people. So part of the difficulty with restraint, there's a lot of difficulties with restraining orders, but there was no judge saying that I didn't deserve it. Every judge was like, you deserve it. That if someone doesn't have a fixed address, if you don't know where to find them, you can't serve them, right? It has to. It needs, it needs that to go into effect. I'm just taking all this in. It's uh, it's it's a, it's a lot. Thinking about the fixed address, even just the fixed address thing. It's like if you can't, so you can't get a restraining right. order because they them. can't serve them. And so if they're Correct. a transient or so they have no, there's couch surfing, right. like right, they just don't assume they're a threat. <laughs> Right. Or, or say you just don't know where they live. Right. So then you can't serve it. And so my whole thing is if you can send me a death threat over email, why can't I send you a restraining order back through the same? And there's there's ways to know if an email has been opened up. Like we have legal yeah. precedent for things like um, foreclosure notices. You can do that digitally. Like why can't we do that? So anyway, so anyway, for they were saying, yes, we'd give you a restraining order, but you don't know how to serve it. So luckily... Not luckily, because he did something awful to a woman in San Francisco. My stalker was detained for an incident with somebody else. They see my pending restraining order in the computer, and he got served. So that was that was fortunate. Um, so then I start helping other people get restraining orders. I've actually done a hundred now for people. I always say it's not a frozen yogurt punch card. Um, so I stopped counting at a hundred, but I started, I started going. Well, I need to be the person that I needed. You know what I mean? Like I needed to start like helping other people with the things that I've learned. So I started kind of getting involved that way. Um, and then and then we started filming in 2016, which aired in 2017. They did a two hour special uh, on uh, 48 hours. And my story was like, the, the first hour was like a bunch of people who were stalked. The second hour is all my story. And you know, 48 hours, it was a big one. I think like 17 million people watched the first two hour special and um, you know, 48 hours, they they did something which is really complicated for me now to think about, which is they, and I understand as producers why they did it. And I have to say a lot of these shows, they're used to doing homicides. 
They're used to doing cases that have been adjudicated. They're not used to doing unadjudicated cases with living survivors, right? So I believe that they were nothing but well-intentioned in this, which is they made the decision to interview my stalker without telling me or asking me. So on one hand, I have this like incredibly compelling, terrifying footage of my stalker threatening to kill me, to do all these things. And so like on one hand, I'm like, why does the public need, like that's what it took for the public to believe me. Like you didn't just believe me, now we need this footage. But what ultimately happened was I believe that's what triggered my stalker to attempt to kidnap me, right? So that's a very, a very heavy thing. And like, again, I have this footage, no one could deny it, but I, I just wish I had been asked if that was something that I wanted. I might have said yes. I might have said yes, get me that footage, get me that evidence. But it was so jarring for me to get the emails from my stalker saying, yay, we're on the show together. We're gonna, and I was like, it was so messed up. Yay, we're on the show together. Right, right. So that's what really got him fired up. So then my stalker comes to LA with the express purpose of killing, kidnapping, raping me, you know, all those things. He comes to LA looking for me. He tries to kidnap my dog from the dog groomer. He tries to, he goes to where I get my eyelashes done and scares all the women. So um, my stalker was also stalking Kim Kardashian. And, and so I had been in contact with her very intense ex Mossad security team. And I thought for sure, you know, ex Mossad, like no one's more badass than them, that they're gonna catch right. him. So that's, that's what I thought. And that's not what happened, even though they are amazing and we should all be so lucky. Um, the 13.5 million Americans currently being stalked, we do not live in gated communities and we do not have uh, security teams. People, they're people no. <laughs> like me. Um, and then he writes me and he tells me that he knows I go to LA Comic Con and he's gonna go there and he's gonna kidnap me. And that way he can, harness my powers since I'm not using my powers that I'm not using properly so he can go fight ISIS, right? That's his oh, current okay, delusion. Got mm -hmm. Right, got it. Um, so he doesn't know that I actually know the owners of LA Comic Con. So I worked with Comic Con. I will say they were amazing. The kids were never in danger. Like they have such great security. They helped me get uh, security and dress them up, you know, like Batman, Superman, whatever to like blend in. And when my stalker came to get me, we caught him and we turned him into LAPD. So, and by the way, LAPD just loves when I share that part. Of it. But that's what happened. That's what happened. Was I, I we caught that. So, Batman and Superman. I, I I may be wrong. It may be another. It might have been Thor. I don't know. I wasn't. I was in a different part of the building. Luckily, security dressed as characters caught my stalker, called LAPD, delivered him. And then out of nowhere, I don't I don't know the details, but he Gwyneth Paltrow served him a restraining order. There was something he did to her children that was scary. I don't even I know. I'm like, I don't even know if Gwyneth Paltrow's in the mix. So um he was then held on a million dollars bail, which like never happens, but that was amazing that they did that because he couldn't pay his bail. Slightly in this in the interim, in that year's time, Vice did this article about me where they called me the Aaron Brockovich of stalking which was like uh -huh. a lot to a lot to live up to right like that's like a that's right. like but what that what that meant was that people who were enduring this particular crime started contacting me like literally every single day since that article came out because if you're being stopped you know you're googling you're looking for help so that's when i started doing the restraining orders pulling trackers off cars support groups i do i do like courts like i go to court with people and be like a human shield so that's when all that sort of activism was happening to you so really fast, you said pulling, pulling track, pulling trackers off of cars. Like that's I right. Anyone can go. Anyone can go to Amazon for fifty bucks and put a GPS tracker on the bottom of your car, and they do. I mean, it's really simple. Like if someone's trying to surveil you, they can send you a link that says like fifty percent off Sephora. You click on it. They're in the GPS on your phone. Like that's the kind of stuff that I teach people how to look out for because it's um, what I've had to deal with. So. I can see your eyes. You're just like, this is so <laughs> sorry. And it's a lot. I, so, did, I, so... I think that this is the, the thing that I, that, that I, I'm going to interrupt you for, for a second. This is the thing that I get when I talk to other survivors and when I talk to, to people who have gone through, especially like this, this, especially it, it, it's so much more prevalent in stalking, I think. And, um, SA and, <clears throat> the lengths that these people go to and the amount of effort that they put in is 
astonishing. And I think that, you know, when I think about like the things that you and I are doing and the, and the amount of work that we put in to try to raise our awareness, to try to talk to people, to try to bring stories to light, there is somebody on the flip side doing the opposite. They are doing, they are plotting, they are scheming. And then you say, you know, he came from a wealthy or affluent family that was obviously bankrolling. You know, you think about um, uh, Robert Durst, for example, you know, who passed away from COVID this year, you know, was about ready to face trial for the murder of his uh, ex-wife, Kathleen McCormick, right? Or his wife at the time and her disappearance of what happened. And then you have this whole, um, you know, you, you have some, you know, he was from one of the wealthiest real estate families in New York city and he was able to fund his lifestyle of doing bad shit because of this. And it's just, it's, it, it's mind boggling. Yeah. People who are obsessed and fixated. I mean, it, it can, ha it can be anybody from all walks of life who's, uh, you know, both the victim and the offender in this case, but definitely it almost is a crime of privilege in that you have to have, like, you can't be working a regular, you know what I mean? It's like very hard, um, which isn't to say that stalkers don't have regular jobs, they have plenty that do. Um, but in my case, uh, he just had all the free time in the world to stalk myself and many, many other people. So, um, so yeah, so the day, the day of when we were supposed to have my trial, um, I have my victim impact statement. I'm like ready to go. And I get there and the, the DDA tells me that we're going to take a plea deal. Like, okay. For felony stalking max, but whatever. I, no one else has ever made him a felon before. This is a, this is a big get, even though I always say like the idea of just like, what is justice? You know, it doesn't restore or repair any of what happened to me. And no. it's certainly just, it's temporary. So, um, he got, well, so in California, I have to explain, we have a law that I understand why people voted for it. It's called Proposition 57. And the language that was put out was, you know, people who are convicted of nonviolent offenses get reduced sentencing, which makes a lot of sense, right? To me, I'm like, oh, cannabis, whatever, who cares? But what they don't explain to people is the list of crimes that California considers nonviolent, which includes rape of an unconscious person, forced sodomy, human trafficking, and stalking, all crimes which I consider to be violent. And so because of that, the four years, right, your eyes are bugging mine too. Um, wow. The four year sentence was, yeah, the four year sentence was automatically reduced to two. It was cut in half, right? It was already so hard to get. It's not that long. And then it was immediately cut in half because it was Prop 57. So he'd already served a year, right, waiting for trial. So a year later, he gets out and is reoffended in three days. Three days. He goes to jail for two, two years for stalking me. Um, one of the guards at the jail actually contacted me and told me he had been writing me letters the entire time. He just didn't have my address. So he was clearly fixated the whole time. And three days later is making YouTube videos about me. And so, yeah, I've had to put him in multiple times uh, since. So this, people always say to me, I'm so sorry that it happened to you. That sounds terrible. I'm so glad it's over. I'm like, it's, it's not over until one of us dies. Like this is not, it's not over. I think when, when I met you, we were talking about, uh, you, you said he kind of cycled through everybody. So one month he'd be focused on somebody. So he was also continuing to, to stalk these famous, these other famous women or higher profile women with you know, a lot more affluence or, or, you know, could afford their own private security teams and things of that nature. So he was just kind of cycling through and then he'd come back to you and then he'd be obsessive. So was he focused on one particular individual at a time? And then you wouldn't hear from him for like months on end. And then it'd be like, oh, it's now my turn again. Is that how that worked or? Yeah, it's a great question. Sometimes he would send emails where he like CC'd me with like Kim Kardashian's publicity team and Yvonne, like sometimes it was all of us because he would he'd be so angry at women in general or it was me. He, again, the, the nature of schizoaffective disorder is he kind of cycles all through and same with his people, right? Like there would definitely be times where I'd get a couple weeks off for sure. And then uh, my, my detective would always be like, oh, it's over. I'm like, bro, it's not over. And then sure enough, right. like he would contact me like a couple days later. Um, so yeah, he goes, he goes through cycles, but it's, it's just kind of dormant. It's not gone. Yeah. Which is another thing I have to point out. So my stalker currently has an ankle monitor, which I guess it sounds good, but it's kind of pointless. Uh, it's pointless because 
the corrections department only checks it like once a week, which doesn't do any good. So one of the things that I'm constantly advocating for and I'm trying to do is, I think I told you this idea for an ankle monitor app. We can, we can use geofencing. Like what if I had an app on my phone and it would be kind of like whatever my restraining order was, say a thousand feet. And if he came within a thousand feet of me, I'd get an alert on my phone. Like, yeah, a hundred percent. If you get if you can get alerts for COVID, I mean, that's a very interesting point because you then you have these you know violation of privacy rights and all these things that people can go up in arms about. But I think with the with the effectiveness of the COVID monitoring situation, when you get these alerts, why wouldn't that work with this this, this geofencing technology? I mean, that sounds like a very practical and completely reasonable request. Yes. So part of what I do, so I was appointed the Los Angeles district attorney. They chose nine of us from around the city and I was chosen as the gender-based violence advocate. So that's the kind of idea that I bring forward right here in Los Angeles. And it's my hope that we can do this and then bring it to other cities. So that's kind of, um, you know, a lot of my focus. And then, and I got, I'm, I'm laughing too, by the way, I'm like, have you ever had anyone out talk you? Has there ever been, have you ever been this quiet before? I'm like, I've never seen you no, so quiet. I'm sorry. But that's okay. Talk, I've never. It's great. It's great. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, back, back to you, Collier. I love how you called me on that too. That's fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> But no, I'm happy to, I'm, you, there's so many questions I have for you and just, um, I guess the first thing we touched upon a while ago uh, was you were talking about the victim shaming and sort of the, the messages that you had received initially from other women and you used a term and I can't remember what it was, but reverse misogyny maybe or something like that or Inter internal internalized misogyny. Okay. Internalized misogyny. What is that exactly? Yeah. That's where you, a woman internalizes a misogyny. It's where there's a self-hating woman. They hate other, they hate other things about other women. Got it. They take out the right. So they, um, so then you, so you got these messages from them sort of saying what, what did you deserved it or that you were asking for yeah. it or all of mm -hmm. anything, anything we can imagine. And you were getting those over social media. It's like you're reading. Yep. It's like you're reading my tweets, everything you just said. Yeah. Wow. And so that is ob obviously a part of, because I've had you, you know, I've heard you discuss this before um, about, mm -hmm. you know, reframing the narratives when it comes to victims and, and getting away from the victim. It's something I talk about too, but it's, you know, uh, yeah, I, I even have people say, well, you know, your mother stayed with your father cause she, he was a doctor and he was rich. And I'm mm -hmm. like, no, my mother stayed with my father because she had a son. And my mother's also the one that yeah. put him through medical school <laughs> and worked so he could go to medical school. Yeah. And it mm -hmm. wasn't like she was just, a, you know, sitting at home eating bonbons, you know, she was very mm -hmm. proactive and ran his books and did things like that. So, you know, that's an interesting uh, you know, it, 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 it's always gross and, 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 you know, but uh, people are ignorant, I think, it, it, you know, and, and they literally are ignorant because they just don't understand. So then they, therefore they jump to conclusions. They make their own, it's something that makes them feel comfortable on what, on, you know, and what they are able to, uh, rationalize in their head and then, and then process themselves. Right. Um, so you know, we've, we've discussed a little bit of that, about that off, you know, outside of this podcast, but what are some of the things that you're, you know, I guess, you know, one of the things that you and I talk a lot about is, is conscious true crime. And, you know, obviously I came into this and I'm sort of still exploring this space, right. With the podcast and uh, talking to fellow survivors and true crime sort of celebrities like Chris Hansen. And um, I guess for me, what, what are some of the, the ways that you're now being active in that space as well to sort of reframe a narrative? Well, um, I started a whole ass company. It's called Lenora Claire Consulting, which you're about to join. So we'll get your beautiful <laughs> face up yeah. there too. Um, and so what I did was I kind of, I call us the bad bitches of true crime, right? So there's a whole bunch of us like 
like Tara Newell and Amanda Knox. And, you know, so one of the roles, I don't know if you're familiar with an intimacy coordinator. Oh yeah, an intimacy, yes, okay, yeah, so absolutely, it, yes, I do, yeah. Right, yeah, so for, for listeners who may not know, intimacy coordination kind of sprung up after me too. And it was, you know, in like a, a love scene or a nude scene that is a person who's trained and they're on set to make sure that the, the actors are respected, you know, boundaries are crossed and everything's kosher, right? And I was like, that's a really cool thing, but why is it that when you're a victim, you go on these shows and there's nobody advocate, there's nobody looking out for you. It's oftentimes it's a producer who's like manipulating you, coercing you, trying to get a sound bite out of sure. you, which may not be authentic to, to what you want. I mean, I mean, look, I've worked on reality TV. We, we do the same thing. And it's, it, I mean, it's not about yeah. someone's victimhood. It's like, well, we want you to say this about yeah. the pool that we just installed in your backyard and how you were just desiring right. to have this hot tub and you couldn't stop thinking about it. It's like, no, I, I didn't really care last. My husband made me get the hot tub. You know what I mean? Like, and you're trying to get these sound bites. Yeah. And, and so I can imagine, and I, and I just know for myself, yeah. like when they're trying to draw something out of you, it's like, you know, I, I think that's where the difference is between myself and a lot of other victims who have been exploited by these programs or by these podcasts or, or shows is I, from very early on outside of forensic files, which they did the episode about my family, uh, and I wish I refused to participate if they were, unless they were going to pay me. And then I was like 22 years old at the time. And I was like, if you're not going to pay me X amount of money, I'm not going to come on the program. And I was able to actually frame my narrative and control my narrative. So they weren't doing things for shock value with me. Let me ask you something that's really going to put him back on his heels and give us the tears or whatever it is. I, everything was controlled by my side or my personal side of you're not, you're not going to get me to say anything that I already wouldn't tell you, you know, or you're not going to get me to say anything uncomfortable. And as I delve into this, you know, doing this podcast, speaking to individuals, I have realized that they do do that. They just try to manipulate that. You're so, so rare. I'm so fortunate that that was that, that was how that happened. You know, it was completely on it. Yeah. It was like a dumb, you know, I fell into it that way. Cause I was like, this is just what makes me feel comfortable. But there's other people that, that they don't have that luxury and they get exploited. And so I think what you're, so you're trying to, to look out for these people. So anyways, continue. I'm sorry. I interrupted you, but. Right. So, well, that's okay. We're going to, we're going to talk over each other a lot. So that's just going to happen. But, um, you know, people, especially when they're fresh in their trauma, like the event just happened and they're shoving cameras in their face, they're still in a daze. They're not okay. They're not really, they, it's really, an, they can't, you can't almost give informed consent because you're not thinking clearly. You're just, you know, so all, all of that stuff happens. So, yeah, so I created it originally thinking that the consulting company was just going to be me. That's why it's not like an ego thing why I chose the name. I literally just thought it was going to be me. And then very quickly I started to realize, wow, this is much bigger than this. So on one of the things that we do is the victim survivor liaison where I can go on set and I can work with the victim survivor family and be that liaison to production, make sure everybody's boundaries are respected and that, there's that. Then we have the consultancy, which everybody should take a look at the Lenora Claire Consulting LLC website. Like it's such an amazing, I'm, I really just have such respect for all of you. I've got amazing forensic psychologists, prosecutors, homicide detectives, transdo task force, a sex assault in the military expert, a sex assault on campus expert, right? So both scripted and unscripted rather than just like fabricating the experience. Like if you're doing a film about what it's like to be a wrongful conviction story, you could actually hire Amanda Knox and you can talk to her, you know? Sure. So we do that. And then the other, the other problem I was seeing, and this again is like the producer and the casting part of my brain was I was watching these shows and some of the experts were just, like I say, experts loosely, bad. were just trash. They were yeah. just people and just terrible, <laughs> terrible. And so, like, I have these, like, amazing experts. So it's like, I've done all the work for you, producers. These are, like, all, it's all a one-stop shop. So, yeah. Um, yeah. And then my my main goal is to, what I want for everybody is, and I, I have been meeting with networks because, you know, there's, there's a lot more to it. So I've been meeting with networks. And what I'm trying to do is get, like, retainer agreements where the network will have us look over their content, make mind, again, I'm not trying to censor anybody, but make some mindful recommendations like, hey, this language is kind of offensive. You know, um, these photos, like, it's, like, way too much, this family, you know, it's kind of that kind of stuff. Um, but also, ultimately, I'm trying to bring apart the idea of things like aftercare, you know, the people don't realize this if you don't work in the industry, but shows like Intervention, they used to give the addicts six months of therapy afterwards, which is incredible. That's a wonderful thing. So why yeah, aren't they cool. doing that 
with with us, right? So I'm there like advocating because I'm really trying to change the standards and practices from from the inside, like at the network level, and kind of trickle down. And on top of that, even these true crime producers, like, look, maybe you worked on Jersey Shore before you did this, you know? Like, you, how, who's to say that you can be looking at these graphic homicide photos? Maybe you need a little therapy too. So. Um, you know, I'm really just trying to make it a better, safer, uh, for less everyone and traumatic and, place for all of us. And the yeah. thing is, is that, you know, I, I realize that these production companies, you know, look, I, you and I share a very common thread, which is we both worked in the industry for a very long time and you were raised out here. You know, okay. I've worked as a DP cinematographer yeah. for almost 10 years. Right. And my whole process was to, you know, getting involved in the business was to tell my story and my mother's story. Right. Uh, which I did with the murder in Mansfield, but the the thing that is unique you know so we provide this perspective on it and you know when covid hit those budgets increased by 30% because you had to have covid compliance officers you had to have all this is the zoning the training the testing the 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 testing day of the all this stuff and productions found a way to make it happen they still do right and they they found a way to dig into those budgets so for them to add this as a line item for a line producer to bring in and this might be greek for a lot of people listening but it is very easy to do this and the effect is exponential because you're looking out for the people that are involved just like you are with covid and you're looking out for the people who you are are putting at risk by opening up and telling their story and and sharing these intimate details and you're probably going to get a lot better story out of them if they feel safe and protected because you know when I, when I speak to people just outside of the podcast other victims they come to me as, as much as they do to you because we've been there we come from that background and they feel safe telling us things that they wouldn't tell anyone else and if you can provide that safe space you will get better content in the end and that's what they have to realize. Totally. It's a, it's it's just like sex. When you have enthusiastic consent, you have better sex when the other person isn't just like reluctantly there when they want to be there. Sure. It's you're exactly right, Collier. And you know, it's uh, when you were talking about so line items or or literally what it sounds like it's it's like the itemized list of the cost of things, right? So to me, it's like if you're profiting off of pain and there isn't this sort of respect and consideration back, then that is the definition of exploitation, isn't it? That's yeah. what these shows are. So to me, I'm trying to just like introduce the uh, the concept around equity. Like I always say, let the person have some say in their story. Let or if they're if the creators are getting more than the people who are sharing their trauma out of it, that's not right. No. I I tell my story. I don't love telling my story. It's not fun, right? But I do it because I'm like this is the platform that's going to help. So it's, it's worth it to me, but so it just, it has to be worth it. And that can mean a lot of it, whatever the person's needs are, they, they deserve to have equity. They deserve that something equal in it. And it's not just the content creator, you know, making a, making a shit ton of money. And then you leave the victim drained and yeah. upset and just their, their life is, you know, cause again, they don't realize little things like when you, cause you do a show, and then a year, two, three years later, it's on some other network, buys it, whatever, and it sure. just plays. And then all of a sudden your inbox is full of all this shit. And you're like, a choice that made sense to me five years ago, maybe doesn't make sense to me now. And it's all, so it's like, there's a, there's a lot to it. And you just want to make sure that everybody feels as good as possible well, well, around it. I'll give you a perfect example of my story. I just received a message yesterday from someone showing me a screenshot of a murder in Mansfield on Hulu. And they were just, and they're a friend and they were sending it to like, as a supportive thing and just thought you should know. And I'm like, oh, wow, it's back on Hulu. Now that was a production that I'm the co-executive producer, the creator of, right? And, yeah. you know, and I, I was, you know, it was, it was not that ID approached me. It was not that Barbara Koppel approached me. It was, I approached all of them and I said, Barbara, I want you to do this project. Well, I said to my friend, John Morrissey, you want to do this project? And then we went to Barbara and then, it, you know, it, it started, the genesis started with me instead of reverse. And so I can't even imagine when it's like, oh yeah, they're airing your story again. Oh, they're airing this. And you're just like, yeah, I got, yeah, they've just exploited me for the hundredth time. Um, you know, with myself, it's like, I, I don't, I don't derive any profits from the, the show and, and. I, you know, I never did it for money. So I made the least out of anyone, which is, you know, I didn't do it for that. Right. I did it to tell the story, but 
you know, I can only imagine when these things just keep playing and playing. It's like, oh, you're back on TV. Call you. They're talking about your dad killing your mom. If I wasn't in control of that some way, like, and it floods. My inbox will flood with people saying, hey, just saw you on Hulu. Hey, just, it's constant. I mean, for me, I'm with the podcast, I'm out there on TikTok. I've a you know ever expanding TikTok after going viral there after a couple months ago, you know, and I'm on social media actively doing all of this. But I feel like if I wasn't, it would just be like, oh God, here it is resurfacing again. Here it is resurfacing again. And that is something that I think people that consume true crime really need to understand is that yeah, this is your favorite case or this is your favorite episode, but this is somebody's nightmare. This is somebody's horror. You know, there's mm-hmm. this, there's this podcast called My Favorite Murder. And it's like, you know what my favorite murder is? The one that doesn't happen, the one that stopped. That's my favorite yeah. murder. You yeah. know, it's not like, let's talk about these things and let's exploit them. And you know, th- these companies make an ungodly amount of money. And it's it's time in my mind, and I think in yours, to really start examining how they treat the victims and the survivors that give them the content that makes them money in the first place, <laughs> you know? That, that's exactly it. I said, you know, especially post Me Too, I felt like the next sort of, movement would be the victim rights movement, right? And all the ways from like Marcy's Law, which I don't know if people know what Marcy's Law is. It's, I forget how many states it's in, but it's it's the victim, like our, how we're notified and a lot of a lot of stuff like that. But as, but as far as this content creation, just the fact like there's this really bizarre disconnect. Like I saw something in the, the crime, crime Con Facebook group where like this woman was advertising, um, you get a massage and you listen to a true crime murder story and how relaxing it is. And I was like, <laughs> how relaxing it is. I, 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 okay. You know, I try not to judge other people's stuff, but like, I just, again, I'm not shitting on people cause I consumed true crime before I was a true crime story. I understand the fascination. Yes. There's some people who are trauma tourists and there's other people that want to know the red flags. They want to be better educated. They may have been touched by crime themselves. I, I, again, not a problem with people consuming it. I just, it's the disconnect. These are not stories. These are real people's lives, yeah. you know? And so I, I, I find it really tis, distasteful at like some of these conventions when they do like the blood splatter nails and like yeah. all that shit. It's like, that's it, all you got. All I got to say to somebody is take whoever you love the most in this world. Who, who, it could be yourself if you don't love anybody else, but hopefully you love somebody and imagine the most horrific crime happened to them. Do you think this shit should be like, do you know what I mean? Like just think of that when you're, when you're consuming this stuff, if it was about your loved one and if it, they were treated with the respect that you'd want them to have. Well, there's a great, you know, and, and, and you're absolutely right. And when I, I talk to people and they're, and they're like, well, Betty, I don't understand. I said, I said, have you ever seen John Wick? And like, you remember the part of the beginning? Oh, mm-hmm. I can't watch that. I can't when they kill the dog. And I'm like, no. exactly. That's a dog. <laughs> mm-hmm. Now try to take that, put that as a person that you can't watch mm-hmm. it or listen to that. Think about that if that's your loved one. That's right. You know, and then there, and then it, and it hits them. They go, oh, whoa, mm-hmm. you're, you're totally right. And I'm not yeah. excoriating them or, or, yeah. or you know, saying, look, you know, don't, don't do this. It's just consume it in a way that is, uh, that you're conscious of who these people are. And, you yeah. know, I have people that reach out to me that, that listen to other true crime podcasts, right? Or they've discovered me on other true crime podcasts. And they're like, you know, you're really doing some great things with talking about this, but I never really thought about when I'm consuming uh-huh. these, who the victims are. And thank you for talking about these things, interviewing people like uh-huh. you know, yourself and Tara Newell and bringing, bringing these stories to light of like, you know, it's okay. We don't mind that you do this, but also yeah. understand that we're human beings and that this is our suffering that you're listening to being yeah. exploited and just be aware of that. And they're just like, wow, I really want to, and, and there is a general, there's a general consensus from people that reach out to me that say, you know, we want to be better consumers. It's just like, you know, I I make sure I will spend more money on environmentally sound products, Mm -hmm. not because I make more money, but because I want a better environment. So I don't mind getting something because I know that what I'm doing is better for the planet than just buying something that is cheap, that is going to destroy our water system or water supplies or, or the oceans or, or wherever. Right. Mm -hmm. And, People will do that with true crime. They just have to be made aware. And I think that people, individuals like yourself, like myself, like others that are really doing that is, is helping to raise that awareness. And it's very cool. So I commend you for, for all the work you're doing. Yeah. And I, everything you said really resonates with me. And again, it's just like, just make sure it's, it's for, 
it has meaning behind it, right? And so kind of what I want to do with the company is it's just like when you see like, you know, these eggs are cruelty free and you go like, I'm going to choose a cruelty free eggs, right? I want to do yeah. that with our company and the sort of branding is like if we get behind this podcast, this, this movie, this show, whatever, it's saying that as survivors, like, we're, we're cool with the way that this was made. Everybody was treated properly. It's, it's, I don't know if your listeners are familiar, but porn has a movement right now as well. It's ethical porn, right? And it's for people who yeah. want to consume that. And, and I, I just think that's great. And I, I just, I, I think it, it, we really can't drive that point home hard enough about how important it is because you've already been harmed by nature of why you're telling your story. Let's let, let's not do like an additional layer of harm and trauma. You've already been through enough already. Well, you have, a, you have disclosures at the end of films where it says, you know, the SPCA will say, you know, no yeah. animals were harmed on this project. Yeah. Why can't you do that with people? <laughs> well, that's what, know. that's what we're trying to do with the company. So, I mean, yeah. I have a couple of very exciting meetings coming up. And so hopefully, you know, again, it's a really weird thing to like create a business that didn't exist before and to be calling out people for things that they've done. But, um, people have been very cool and there's some major things coming up. So hopefully, hopefully, hopefully cool. you get to see that sticker. Yeah. Which exactly. is very cool. So L Lenora, where can we, uh, where can we find you? on uh on the interwebs yeah so um pretty much well my, my twitter got hacked so um uh, i'm mostly active on instagram facebook um you know i might i haven't done TikTok because i said i don't know if tick if the internet deserves me if they're gonna act right uh, but i know you've done so well on TikTok. so um if people want to see me do a TikTok, they can just write on my instagram and maybe i'll make a TikTok. i don't know maybe only, only because you're so good at it. I'm like, maybe, maybe I'll take a look at it. Oh, thanks. But yeah, so, uh, so what are your handles? Where do we, where do we find you? It's, it's just at Lenora Claire. Yeah, and and mostly find fi fi find me on Instagram. I I answer everybody. Fantastic, uh, Lenora Claire. Thank you so much for joining the program. It's been a privilege to talk to you and to hear your story and and hear all the work you're doing. And I hope you come back. I'd love to have you again. Yeah, and anytime. We're we're real life friends, so you can call me anytime. We're real life friends. Yes, this is very you know. true. <laughs> we, yeah. Oh, really fast. Most important thing of the entire thing for those that are watching the video. Where is Noni? Oh, no, let me grab her. Sorry. Nomi is always right by me. She was sleeping. Erg. She'll come say hi. She's right here. For those of you that are that are listening, <laughs> Nomi is a minpin. Whoops. A Make very sure. spoiled <laughs> minpin who has yeah. taken over one of Lenora's husband's two. drawers. In their, <laughs> two uh, drawers. Two, two for her outfits. So let, let's see her. Oh, no, me. Okay. Yeah, I mean, my husband knows who he married. Like, he, he wears a baby Bjorn and carries her around. He knows. He knows what he signed up for. Uh, yeah, she's got she the, the long know. legs. She's the long legs like New England showgirl. Usually she has wigs on. We, we should have dressed up for you. Uh, well, you know what? That'll have to be another episode for sure. Yeah. Anytime. All right. Um, thank you so much, Lenora. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you. So every time I talk to Lenora, and I talk to her a lot, <laughs> uh, I'm just sort of dumbfounded. I I'm amazed at what she does for people. I'm amazed at she how she handles... Um, with such grace and poise and sense of humor, <laughs> how she deals with her situation and how she deals with helping other victims and being a light in their sort of solar system to really help guide them and saying, look, you know, uh, I'm here and I'm here to help you. I'm here to make a difference and an impact on the world and to help you do the same and to look out for you because a lot of times these people, and, and this is something that I'm, be, as I've said on the program many times, having gotten into doing this podcast, having gotten into this world of true crime where I have seen other victims um, and other survivors have their stories exploited by other podcasts, by news organizations, by television series that make boatloads of money off of these victims laying their souls bare. And, you know, their worst, you know, somebody's true crime fantasy podcast or, or true crime story that they obsess over is someone's worst day of their life. I mean, literally I've been very fortunate because I have always taken control of my story 
and obviously made the film A Murder in Mansfield with two-time Oscar winner Barbara Koppel, John Morrissey, my friend who made American History X, a little plug there. Uh, but I got to make it with really cool people that I wanted to make my story with. And uh, I was able, I was the driving force for that. You know, I found everybody, I put everybody together, but not everyone is that fortunate. And so to have someone like Lenora looking out for these victims, these survivors, is a really cool thing. And I'm just grateful to have known her. I'm honored to know her. And, and to get to know her and the work that she's doing, that she continues to do and that she will do in the future. She's an amazing human being and having her on the program was a real honor. So I just wanna say that shout out to you, Lenora Claire. You're, you are awesome. You are fantastic. You're doing such great work. So, um, but you know what? It always doesn't matter what I think. It matters what you guys think. You guys are the audience. I am here bringing you guys guests that I feel inspiring and motivating. And, you know, it doesn't always have to be about, you know, sad things and true crime. It also can be about the moving past all of this, which is what this program is about. Dealing with your trauma, embracing this, and doing something positive with your life. But again, it's not what I think. It's what you guys think. So I love hearing your listener feedback. Contact me on Instagram, Twitter. It's at Collier Landry, Facebook. You find me on TikTok at Collier Landry. Uh, you can go to my website, collierlandry.com. If you are watching this, that means you are watching this on my YouTube channel, which is youtube.com forward slash call your Landry. Uh, thank you all for tuning in. Thank you for sharing the podcast with everyone and anyone you can. Your positive reviews and even your slightly negative reviews are all greatly appreciated. And I try to read every piece of, of email and direct message that I get from you guys. I really do. And I try to respond as much as I can. So I thank you for that. Please keep it up. I love hearing from you guys. So uh, anyways, I, you guys have a great week. Thank you for tuning in. I'm Collier Landry, and this is Moving Past Murder. Thanks, y'all. This podcast is made possible by support from listeners just like you. Please subscribe via Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Audible. Find us on YouTube, youtube.com forward slash Collier Landry. The film A Murder in Mansfield is available on Investigation Discovery, Discovery Plus, and Amazon Prime Video. This podcast is a production of Don't Touch My Radio in association with RSA Entertainment. Please visit mpmpodcast.com to show your support today.